Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Jessica Green, and together with Reverend Dr. Zena Jacques and Claire Nelson, we welcome you to Courageous Conversations presented by Urban Consulate at Barrington's White House. Thank you for joining us second Wednesdays this winter and spring to learn and practice how to nourish a culture of belonging in our community. We are live streaming tonight. Uh, just to make you aware that there are cameras rolling. So hello to our friends tuning in from home. And as always in our dialogues, we invite you to hold our six grounding virtues from on being, which are over there behind the podium. So generous listening, humility, patience, hospitality, adventurous civility, and that words matter. Before we dive into tonight's topic, we've got some good news. We have a wonderful um, series of sessions lined up for second Wednesday evenings through April. Tonight, belonging begins in the body with Dr. Krista Robinson Lyles, whom we love so much that, here's a fun fact, she is the only person we have invited back three times in the four years that we've been doing this. So. <laughs> I think you're in for a really special treat. Um, in February, we have a special dinner and dialogue edition with special guest Chef Christian Lucky Bell from Atlanta, who was just featured in an Essence Magazine review of top black restaurants across the country. Chef Lucky will take us on his American culinary journey from southern roots to fusion flavors through a four-course dinner and dialogue. This is a bit of a homecoming for Lucky, who was born in Chicago. This one is definitely filling up fast and has limited seating, and there will not be video or live stream. As you can imagine, you don't really want to watch people eat. Um, <laughs> just the experience in the room. So you'll want to grab your tickets for in-person now. And also, he happens to be Zena's son. In March, How to Be an Upstander is backed by popular demand um, with one of our favorite presenters, Janan Mohajer of Interfaith America, who also led our Confronting Prejudice session in our first season. There are many people who have asked for this one to come back, and we thought we should bring it back. I think now is a great time to do so. So please, if you're interested, sign up for that one. And in April, Breaking Barriers with the Tony Award-winning actress Allie Stroker. Allie was the first actor to perform on a Broadway stage in a wheelchair. And then, for another first, she went on to win a Tony Award for her performance in Oklahoma. So uh, we have a really exciting spring season, and we really hope that you will join us. We couldn't produce this series without your ticket purchases and the generous support of our sponsors. So we want to thank Barrington Area Community Foundation, BMO Wealth Management, Kim Dugeswa, Tyler and Danielle Lenchuk, Kobe and Eric Struckmeyer, Young Chung, Susan and Rich Padula, Carol and David Nelson, Dennis and Stacy Barsima, Julie Kanak and Mike Regali, and Dominic Green. We also want to thank Barrington's White House, Barrington Area Library, and Be Strong Together, who have been wonderful partners in our work from the start. Can you please give a round of support? <laughs> Tonight, as through all our conversations through the spring, we are exploring what it means to belong to each other, and why that matters, and how we practice belonging in community. This is part of a year-long community-wide initiative to nourish a culture of belonging in Barrington and beyond. And we're so heartened to see how people are picking up this theme in their corners of the community. So just to name a few, Be Strong Together and Barrington Youth and Family Services are hosting Building Belonging Coffee and Conversations at coffee shops throughout the community each month. Emily Snyder, who's here, a little shout out to her, of Barrington Area Soccer Association, has been taking belonging very personally and been connecting with diverse groups throughout the area to teach and play the beautiful game of soccer. Corey Fidus is hosting belonging book clubs. The Humanities Working Group of Barrington's Cultural Commission is hosting a storytelling event here in April. Uh, belonging continues to be the theme throughout Barrington 220 School District this year, inviting students, teachers, and families to reflect on how to create places for learning where everyone belongs. And a big thank you to Village President Karen Darch for acknowledging this community-wide belonging initiative at a Village Board meeting. So everyone is invited to, part, to be a part of this initiative that runs through May, and you can do so by adding your name to the pledge, 
displaying the message, hosting or attending an event, or even just starting a conversation about why belonging matters to you in your home, school, workplace, faith or civic group, sports team, arts and culture club, small business, or wherever you gather. Visit the website, webelongtoeachother.org to learn more about community events and actions. Hi, welcome. Come grab a seat. <clears throat> Find tools and resources about the initiative, download logos and quotes, submit stories and testimonials or order signs and supplies. And we also have signs in Spanish. So if you need them, Follow us also on Instagram at Belonging Together, and that's where we post a lot of the pop-up events that are happening throughout the community. And if you happen to be hosting something, you can reach out to us, and we will also post it there. Um, to date, we've had over 2,500 people visit our website, and we'd love your help in spreading the word throughout the community to neighbors and friends, so please do. One of our favorite quotes guiding this initiative and tonight's conversation comes from noted author, scholar, and teacher, Bell Hooks, who passed last year. She said, I dreamed about a culture of belonging. I contemplate what our lives would be like if we knew how to cultivate awareness, to live mindfully, peacefully. If we learned habits of being that would bring us closer together, that would help us build beloved community. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's special guest who embodies Belle's beautiful vision. We are thrilled to welcome back one of our favorite teachers and facilitators, equity and wellness expert, Dr. Krista Robinson-Liles of Joy Hope Collection, Collective. You may remember Krista from her previous sessions on practicing mindfulness and finding ourselves in each other's stories. Or you may have caught her episode of our podcast, Becoming Courageous, where she offers beautiful wisdom on something we all struggle with, how to keep going with our bridge building for a more inclusive future, even when it's hard. For nearly 30 years, Dr. Lyles, Robinson Lyles has been providing consulting, research, facilitation, teaching, and coaching services to academic and corporate clients. She is committed to creating positive, healthy, and sustainable learning and working environments, and her expertise is in establishing effective strategies for the manifestation of equity and wellness in academic and corporate spaces. In the, in the expanse of her career, she has served as classroom teacher, building administrator and university instructor. In addition to coaching and consulting over 100 professionals in the areas of literacy, racial equity and justice and mindfulness. And she now has her own podcast, Joy Anyhow, where she invites guests to dive deep into what it means to find wholeness in the midst of any storm. Listen to her beautiful conversations at www.joyanyhow.com. With that, Zena. You are up. Welcome back to Barrington. Would you, would you, I, I know this is going to feel a little silly. Would you be willing to say to your hand, I need you and I appreciate you? Yeah. Would you look at your foot, either one, and say, I'm better because you're down there. You all know me. How many people are here for the first time? Oh dear, you don't know me. So behavior is not my strong suit? Okay, good. <clears throat> you can't look at this next part. It's hidden from view, but if you didn't have one, they'd have to cut one for you, called the colostomy. Do you know what I'm talking about? You've called people this name, by the way, so. We don't see that. But if you didn't have one, you would die. It's hidden away, not over here, it's in another place. <laughs> but you appreciate it because it's part of the system that works. And it's the part that has to be kept clean and you don't show it, but it's really important. So I'm not gonna ask you to speak to it, but I am gonna ask you in your heart to appreciate it. Why do I do that? Because this, this is a body. You are a body. And if any one of those parts that you just appreciated was not there, there would be a diminishment in who you are, in who we are. Those of you who don't know me, you have a Baptist preacher standing before you, that's always dangerous. Um, 
but the Apostle Paul, whether, whether you think of this text as anything other than literature is not important in this moment, but in a letter he wrote to a church at Corinth in the 12th chapter of the first letter, 1 Corinthians, it says, this body, he uses that as a metaphor, this body needs every part. If the hand were to say, I'm not part of the body, where would be the touch? If the foot would say, I'm not part of the body, where's the stability? If the eye would say, I'm tired of y'all, I'm leaving, where would be the seeing? And he uses this metaphor in that letter to say every single part. Even the weak, he does not name the weaker part, but he says even the weaker part that is not seen and is often filled with shame, I know what he's talking about, is important and part of the body. Belonging. That, that, that metaphor is essentially about belonging together. And Paul is saying to the people who are listening to him, we need you. We need each other or the body is diminished. Belonging begins in the body. And tonight we'll have a chance to talk about the unique bodies that we each are. And the the metaphor extends because belonging begins in the body, the body that is Barrington and beyond, the body of the communities that are watching in. And it's easy when somebody is an asshole to not want them as part of the body. But the next time you encounter somebody for whom that is the moniker you would like to use, think about your own <laughs> and how much you need it. because there's a role and a place for all. And I know that sounds silly and it may even be offensive and I'm sorry if it is, but I'm serious about this need to come together, to belong to one another, to be an integral whole body. Longing begins in the body. And tonight we will learn about that so that we can live it in our individual bodies and extend it to the body that is the community of humankind. It is a privilege to be in the presence of Dr. Krista Lyle Robinson, so I will shut up and sit down and welcome my sister forward. Oh, Zena, thank you, I will never get that image out of my head. <laughs> oh wow, Zena always tees it up, I'm telling you, every time I get to follow her. I'm so glad to be here, and I don't know, I know some people are new, so I don't know if you know exactly how much time and energy and effort that Jessica and Claire and Reverend Dr. Zena put into these gatherings, but whenever we're planning, they are so intentional, so full of love. They want so much to take what we're talking about out into the world, and so any time I have the chance the privilege to be in their company, the answer is yes, I'm happy to be here. So it's good to be here. And um, I'll start with a couple of things. One is it always feels weird to me. I, can, I never get used to people introducing me. I just, like, I squirm in my seat. It just, it doesn't feel comfortable, so it's just me. Just, that's just that. But I know people are joining us virtually, so I don't want to forget about those groups. Welcome. Um, and there are a few things that I want to say as we start about how we can be together. So we have the, the virtues here, but I wanna say three things that Adrienne Marie Brown, who's someone I've learned a lot from, is teaching me, and maybe this will be useful to you. We are exactly the right people to be having this conversation in this room tonight. There may be people you'd like to invite. There are people I think should be here. <laughs> And you may think of people who need to be in a conversation about belonging. And we are still the right people to be here together tonight. And we can take that out. The other thing is the way that I'm approaching this conversation is one of many ways. So there are lots of entry points into talking about belonging. I'm not suggesting I have the only way and all the advice. But this is a way. And the last thing that I am learning, I was joking with the team about this, I think you all need like a superhero name, like a... Something, we gotta think about that. But we were planning, I was telling them, one of the things I'm working on professionally is letting go of, perf of perfectionism. I love when things are organized and they follow the schedule and it's planned out and it rarely happens that way. So I'm really working on that and I think for you all tonight, 
if you do have that as a habit, to let go of that, to just know that we're not perfect, we don't have to be perfect, we don't have all of the answers, and that's okay. But what I hope we can do tonight is talk about belonging in a deep way that sets up whatever else you want to do this year. So that's what we're going to do. Um, tonight, you may experience some new things, some new practices that you've not experienced. And I'm, again, Zena set us up for this. So I'm glad you started, because now what I do won't seem so weird. <laughs> I'm like, oh, so we could do this. Um, but you know, just experiment with them, see what you think, and you don't have to take them outside of this room. Um, I, my hope is that by the time we're done, you'll have some essential questions that can really help you into whatever communities you belong to outside of here to think more about belonging, and also some anchors or some, some principles that you can use and take with you. So that's my hope, and maybe you'll get more than that. So the question I want to really have us work with and sit with tonight is, what does the world need right now? And what is your stake in that? So what does the world need right now? And what is your stake in that? Um, let me just pause to say I elected not to do PowerPoints tonight. But I will send a slide deck afterwards so you have that. And as you're thinking about your role or your stake in creating or allowing or reviving whatever it is the world needs, where does belonging fit into that? Where does belonging fit into that? So just hold that. We're going to hold that question throughout and work with it in a few different ways. There is a, a book that I really love called The Artist's Way. Does anyone know that book by Julia Cameron? OK. So you might be familiar with the practice she asks us or invites you into of morning pages. If you don't know what that is, morning pages is a simple practice where you can spend three minutes or five minutes or whatever each morning listing all the things that are on your mind. And she advises that you do it when you first wake up so that you can clear your space for the day and be fully present. So I'm going to borrow that and ask if we can do evening pages. So in a moment, I'm going to give us two or three minutes to just list everything that comes to mind for you without editing. We're not sharing these. But just so we can be fully present, if you have a to-do list, if you're thinking about a loved one who's ill, a job, a grocery list, I don't care, write it down. And we won't share these. We'll just kind of put them aside. And at the end, you can take these with you. You can do whatever you want. You can throw them away. So for the next three minutes, in silence, please, everything, just stream of consciousness. Please don't edit a feeling you have about being here, a hope you have, a anxiety, whatever, anything that comes to mind. OK, go ahead and take a look at that list. See what you put on there. See what things you can really put aside. Notice which of those things might still be rising up for you. You can ball the list up and throw it away. You can take it with you for later. But at least for now, it's a symbolic way to really help us put aside what we're all bringing different things in and to say, just for the next 60-ish minutes, I can put those aside. I can put a pause on those and be fully present into this conversation. So that's just a practice you can take with you. Thank you, Julia Cameron. And now I'm going to ask you to do something that I'm happy I'm not doing. <laughs> it's not that hard. But we're going to do a, a quick get to know you as a way of really calling in this idea of belonging. So it's a game called, get, um, what is it called? How is yours? How's yours? And it comes from a facilitator whose name is Daniel Johnson. So it's a really simple game. I'm going to explain it, and it won't take long. And actually, we'll probably need um, this table to join each other for just the game, if that's OK. So the way the game works is you have one person who is a guesser. And the guesser, in a moment, will stand up and leave the table. The guesser steps away while the rest of the table comes up with a topic or an idea that the person who was guessing will have to figure out. So it might work like this. If this were my table and I were the guesser, I would leave. And the table would quickly say, we want to come up with an idea that we want to talk about. We want them to guess. Maybe they say the word is a car. And so when I come back as the guesser, I try to guess what the word is. So I would say to you maybe, um, how is your, and you would say, it's green. Or the next, and I, I try to guess. 
Or to the next person, I say, how was your? And they would say, old. And the next person, I say, I still don't know what it is. How was yours? And they might say, from zero to 60 in no time. And I'm still trying to figure out. So it, it's just a guessing game, OK? And so those are all the clues you get. We'll just do it for a few minutes and see what, where we get. So quickly at your tables, decide who the guesser will be while the rest of the group decides on the topic. So when you have your guesser, the guesser should step away. When your table has decided, raise your hand so I know we can invite your guesser back. OK, so guessers are returning. Quickly decide. Anybody else ready? OK, raise your hand when your table's ready. This table's ready for their guesser to return, OK? OK, another table's ready. OK, so everybody return. We're going to force everybody to be ready. <laughs> so your guessers are returning. <laughs> and the guesser simply comes back and starts asking questions. How is your? How is your is the question. So that was just a, an icebreaker, a way for us to get to know each other. Raise your hands how many tables the guesser got it. Did, did they get it? OK, OK, OK. Oh, wow. OK. Almost everybody. All right. So that game is over. <laughs> People are just like, <laughs> the sign of a good thing. It's a good thing. At your table, as we think about belonging in the body, that was just a way to break the ice a little bit and another way for us to be fully present in the moment. I think most people were really present, so that's good. Um, what I'd like us to do as we start moving more and more into this conversation is to take a post-it note. Everyone at the table can grab one. And on it, I'd like you to write a word, a phrase, a quote, a brief, concise definition if you want, anything that has to do with belonging. So what comes to mind for you when you think about belonging? And I'm not defining it any more than that. Whatever. Put one word, phrase, quote, anything. Take a few moments. Put it on your post-it. What comes to mind when you think about belonging? And if you're virtual, we can just do that in the chat. So one thing that comes to mind when you think about belonging. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to take those post-it notes and pass them to the person to your right. Not yet. <laughs> I know. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> pass them to the person to your right in a moment. And the reason I asked you to pause on that is because when you do, I really want you to pay attention to your body when you read what someone else wrote. So what's happening in your body? Are you having a particular sensation? Are you resisting? Are you leaning in? Are you thinking, yeah? Are you thinking, what the heck? All right, whatever. So you don't have to make a comment. Please don't make a comment, actually. But be really aware of what's happening. And I don't just mean your thoughts. If, if thoughts arise, fine. But also in your body, what's happening, OK? So pass to your right and keep passing them around after you read them until you get your original Post-it note back. <laughs> yeah, you can join any table. Yeah, you can join this table too if you want. So pass it, read it, pass it, read it until you get your original post it note back. <laughs> so again, pay close attention to what you notice. Maybe something, maybe no sensation, but just notice.
And then, Jessica, is it okay if we have a microphone passed so people can share? So when you get your original post-it back, then if you'd like to just read out yours aloud, that's great. Um, and people virtual, if you're putting this in the chat, that's great. You can see those. So if you'd like to share what you wrote on your post-it, you don't have to, obviously. Let us know, and Jessica will bring the microphone. <laughs> Hello. Um, I put celebrating on mine. Am I supposed to give a reason? You can elaborate if you want. So from kind of my initial joining of the belonging campaign was when Abby Wambach came to Barrington in September. And a big thing Abby said um, that night was, you know, we have to kind of stop tolerating people and start celebrating more people. And I just took that as like, I think tolerance is almost a form of intolerance. So just trying to celebrate everyone instead of tolerating people. Mm. So that's Thank why you. I got that word. Okay. Thank you and for the context too. Yes, a couple more. Routine oh, okay. because of all the words that, that we could have chosen, the two of us we have the same word. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. We have the same word. Trust. Mm. And I think that felt even more remarkable and stunning. And I had a visceral reaction. We've never met each other in our mm. lives. Yes. So, <laughs> Thank you. And that's the word that came to both of us. Yeah. Thank you. Trust. Yes. OK. I think we'll pause it there just for a moment. Thank you. So, so trust celebrating, and there, I'm sure there are many more, and they don't all have to be the same. Some people might say scary. Some people might say no thank you. <laughs> like Belonging to what or to whom or who decides what we belong to. So those are all, that can all be true and present. I was watching a docu-series recently, and I was thinking about belonging just because I had talked with the team about being here tonight. And I was listening to, uh, I don't even remember the name of the docu-series, but it was about indigenous people in what is now called Australia. And one of the elders of this particular group was welcoming in a visitor from outside. And he said, and when I say this, just notice if you have any kind of bodily sensation. He said, he welcomed the man, he gave him a hug, and he said, I welcome you by putting my most valuable organ next to yours. I welcome you, as he embraced him, by putting my most valuable organ, my heart, next to yours. So just let that marinate for a minute. Maybe something arises, maybe you have a sensation, maybe not. When I thought, when I heard that, I had goosebumps, and I still get them every time I think about it. And I was really working with what was happening in my body and what, why that resonated so much. And I think it's because I'm not often in spaces where we talk about and think about how we really connect with other people, how our bodies matter in relationship to other bodies, and how the space we take up matters. And the fact that we might do something so, I would say, vulnerable and special as Stating that the act of being next to someone, inviting them in, and then sharing something so valuable, my most valuable organ. So I'm going to talk a little bit more later about the heart and heart math and things like that. But I'm going to invite us throughout the session to really check in with our bodies. And if you've been in a session with me before, you've heard me say this a lot, that our bodies are this perfect radar. Like they are in powerful and, and perfect indicators of what we're experiencing. Our minds can be tricky. Our brains are important, certainly vital. But our brains can really get caught up in logic and trying to shift to please someone in conditioning. And our hearts, our bodies often tell us something that we might be conditioned to ignore. So when we're having a bodily sensation or reaction to what someone says, it's probably the truest reaction, even if our mouths say something different. And that could be a good experience, it could be a difficult experience. So the reason we're talking about belonging in the body is because what you're experiencing in your body when you're talking about belonging or difference or othering 
is probably an indicator, a really good clue about what's happening. And so we want to stop and we want to realize that. And we want to acknowledge something's happening. <laughs> what is this? We want to accept, OK, this is what my body is trying to tell me. And then we can decide what we want to do. So if we just react automatically, we have many fewer options. Like it's a conditioned response. I'm just going to reject. I'm just going to not listen. I just don't want to deal with this. When we pause, we might still say the same thing. Nope, that boundary's still there. I still don't want to listen. But when we can stop and pause a little bit more and allow expansion in our hearts, which is part of belonging, I think, expansion versus contraction, we might be more willing to listen and listen deeply to what someone is saying. We might have more empathy. We might build trust. So it just takes that listening to your body. And the more we practice doing that, there's always, 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 your body's always having a reaction. Maybe you're not tuned into it, maybe you are. Maybe it's a little bitty twinge. Maybe you feel a little nauseous. Maybe you feel sweaty, maybe you, whatever. There's a clue in there, and that's telling us something. So listening is really critical. There's, there is another piece to this thing about belonging that I really want to say, and that is that it is not simple. It can be easy in terms of the practice, but it is complex. I mean, I'm sure you figured that out. But this idea of being able to get proximal to other people when they differ greatly from us in particular, but even when we have family members who we've grown up with, it can be really difficult to figure out the belonging piece. And I'll tell you why I say that. I'll give you a story of why I say that. Um, a few years ago, and I may have said this in, in circles with you before, but a few, about seven years ago, my 11-year-old daughter was riding her skateboard. And she was um, just doing what she always does, riding her skateboard. And I was cooking in the kitchen. And no shoes on, just in there, you know, doing my thing. And I get a phone call from her, frantic. Mom, this guy's chasing me, he's chasing me, and just screaming. You know I left that stuff on the stove in a heartbeat, right? I was out of there. Ran out with no shoes, ran down the street to find her, and the man had driven off. And she's freaking out, I'm freaking out. I still don't know what his problem was. I don't know what the deal was. He got out of his truck, yelled racial slurs at her, and chased an 11-year-old girl. Right, my heart is going, I'll tell you what's happened to my body right now. I'm, this is all happening, it's, it's a bunch of stuff. And there's a lot more to the story after that, but essentially, I was pissed. <laughs> I was traumatized, she was traumatized. And I was telling a friend about this later, a, a few months later, and she said, she was very empathetic, and she said, do you know, I was telling her how the police, when this happened, made my daughter feel like she had done something wrong. They kept saying to her, what did you do? What did you say? Anyway, let me not even go there. So um, my friend said, did anyone, she said, what are you going to do about this? And I said, I don't know. You know, I'm just trying to help my daughter. She said, has anyone talked to this man? Do you know a neighbor who can go and talk to him? I was like, talk to him for what? I mean, would you, sure. <laughs> I, I know some people who go talk to him. That, I'm just being honest with you, that was my first reaction, to protect my baby, right? And I was galled at the fact that she would suggest we go talk to this man. And she wasn't suggesting I do it, actually. She said, do you know a neighbor? He didn't live on my block. It turns out I didn't know anybody who lived on his block. He was a couple blocks away. But I couldn't get in my heart how I should have to extend myself to this man. Why should I want him to belong? to something I belong to. I didn't believe in anything he was espousing. I just couldn't get with that. And so she and I worked together for many years, this friend. And over the years, she said this thing all the time that stuck with me. She said, we never throw anyone away. And when she said that, I was also like, OK, nope. <laughs> nope, you're doing too much. That's not true. And um, my point is, it's not always easy to consider belonging. So when I think about this man, I don't want to belong to anything that he was saying or doing. I didn't want to consider putting my most valuable organ next to his, given what he had done to my child. And never throwing anyone away, this is what I didn't understand. Never throwing anyone away doesn't mean that I had to like what he did or accept what he did. 
It means, is there a community that exists or that we could create where someone who's proximal to him, who knows him, could go and call him in on this? Not excuse it, but say, hey, do you realize the harm you caused? And really try to get at what's behind that. I, I got, you know, was balking at it, because I'm like, that's not my job. I'm, there's no way I can do that. And she wasn't suggesting I would do it. He was on a, what John Paul, Powell sorry, calls the bridge furthest away from me. But there are other people on bridges closer to him that might have been able to intervene and, and bridge this belonging in a different way. So I share that story with you just to say that the work is complicated, right? It's not always easy, and we get to decide if we want to do it anyway. And we don't always have to think about belonging as people who are the farthest from what we would consider belonging. Maybe we start with people who are closer to us. And maybe we build bridges with other people who are closer to the people we're not close to. So I don't want to make it sound like it's easy. So the more I thought about this, the more I was thinking that the root for me of belonging is the absence of fear. The ability to call people in when we're not perfect, since we are not perfect, any of us, even me, <laughs> we are not perfect. It's also, I think, about the vulnerability of opening our hearts to other people in ways that we might not think are possible. It's also about thinking about who belongs and what we belong to. So who gets to decide who belongs to what? Who gets to make those rules? What are we belonging to and what do we give up when we are belonging to something? What do we gain? We're always giving up something if we belong to anything. Maybe it's not a bad give up. And we're always gaining something. And the, the question is, what does it cost us collectively to do that? What does it cost us collectively to belong? There's this quote actually on the We Belong to Each Other website from Byron, Brian Stevenson. I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. He says, we have a choice. We can embrace our humanness, which means embracing our broken natures, and the compassion that remains our best hope for healing. Or we can deny our brokenness, forswear compassion, and as a result, deny our own humanity. So I make that point again. When we're talking about belonging, it can be easy to think about it in terms of something that feels good, and that will benefit all of us, and there's some growing pains, that's all I'm saying. There's some growing pains, and there's some rough, rocky places we have to traverse to get there. So I'm gonna, going to invite us into a practice as we keep moving deeper. And you can either sit for this practice, you can stand for it. Um, it may be new to you, but I'm going to ask you to just try it. You can always not do it again on your own. And the way we want to start is with you closing your eyes or looking down. You want to have a downward gaze just so you're not focused on other things. So either close your eyes if that's comfortable. See if you can find a soft gaze in your lap or on the floor. And this practice I'm bringing, I use it a lot. It comes from Sumitra Rajkumar. And it's a practice of centering and belonging. And so, as you're seated, you might just take a moment and listen to what you hear. And if you're virtual, what do you hear where you are? Maybe what you smell. Maybe what you feel. It might be the air in the room or the clothes on your body. And take a deep, slow breath in through your nose and at your own pace, out through your mouth. And we've only been together for a few moments, but it's a good time for you to check in with your body. And just say, how, how am I doing? How am I in this space? How am I in this moment? And you can also start to get deeper in noticing the temperature of your body and maybe any movements, maybe your stomach's growling. Maybe you're adjusting your back or your neck. And as we go deeper inward, 
Notice your mood. What mood are you in right now? That can shift in any moment, but right now, what mood are you in? Emotions you're feeling. And then go deeper and notice what's happening with your bones, your joints. Just take a moment and notice if there's tightness or slackness anywhere. See if you can pay attention to the, your heartbeat and the rate of your breath. Notice your feet on the floor. And then shift your attention to our center of gravity, your belly button, your navel. Go ahead and place one hand right below your belly button. And just rest it for a moment and notice your breathing as you do that. Just for a moment. You can either keep your hand there or you can just place it in your lap or wherever is comfortable. And we're going to center in what we call the three directions. It's a way of centering, belonging, connecting. So that is length and width and depth. And as we center in length, this is about sitting up as tall as you can, sitting in your dignity. If you're at home and you're standing in your dignity, how tall without pushing or squeezing can you make your spine extend upward into this plane of dignity? And just notice, just notice your posture. Notice if that shifts anything in your emotions or your mood. And just be present with that. Let your jaw soften. Let your joints soften. And then we can center in width. So we retain this length of our dignity. But we can also center in our width, so from hip to hip. And as wide as we can be, Try lifting your sternum just a little bit. Try pulling your shoulders gently back so that you expand your heart a little bit. And see if you can be as wide as you can possibly be and take up as much space in a positive way as you can. And then lastly, we center in depth. So depth is about looking at what's behind us and who's supporting us. And so we bring attention to our back body meaning we start noticing what's happening or what we're feeling at the back of our heads. And we shift our awareness to the backs of our neck and the back of our shoulders. And then we let that awareness travel on down to our butts and our back of our thighs and the backs of our calves and our feet on the ground. And we, in this awareness, allow space to honor everyone who's come before us, all of our ancestors who we may know, we may not know, who have done the deep hard work of living, who have done the deep hard work of hoping, dreaming for things that have allowed us to be where we are. And then imagine that your ancestors are next to the ancestors in a circle of the people next to you. So if you can, even without knowing who they are, imagine a room full of people who are visioning, working for something better together, proud of you, standing behind you, resourcing you, and see if you can feel their support at your back. And as we start to wrap up with this centering, see if you can also shift your attention to all those people who are coming after you. So these would be people for whom you will be an ancestor. These are your beloveds. These are people you may not know. They may be directly in your lineage. They may be people you're in contact with as part of your chosen family. These are your descendants who are relying on us to dream, to hope, to do the work that goes with dreaming. And see if you can envision them and if they can feel your love for them and if you can envision your descendants standing next to the descendants of everyone else in this room, so there's a big circle of ancestors, of us, of descendants, mingling, trusting, belonging. 
take a deep breath. See if you can inhale the vision, the power, the support, the love. Take another breath or two on your own. And then as you open your eyes or lift your gaze, just look around, smile at someone else in the room. Pay attention to what you're noticing in your body. Maybe that practice felt weird. <laughs> Maybe it felt resonant. It's OK. It's just it is what it is. It's something to offer. And I share that practice because however it sat with you, one of the things that I really have to remind myself and other people is that this idea of creating something better when we talk about belonging requires us to be in the imaginal space. We have to dream and imagine and aspire to something else, or we're just stuck with where we are. Our ancestors, whoever they are, whatever they aspire to, they had dreams for something that they may never have seen happen. That doesn't sound very hopeful. I get it. <laughs> I will tell you that in my work over 30 years, I have been so disillusioned. I started off very hopeful, thinking I was going to change the world, ready for it, and so frustrated at not seeing things transform quickly enough, just, just about burned out of it. And I've learned over time that the burnout is real, and I have to pay attention to that, but also that some of the things I'm working for, because I believe in them, I may not see in my lifetime. I may see glimpses of them. I may not see the whole world transform like I thought was going to happen 20 years ago, 30 years ago, yesterday. <laughs> when? But on behalf of people who have come before me, on behalf of my descendants, it is really important to me that I stay in that in a healthy way, that I connect with other people who are doing the work, and that's part of the belonging piece. So I want to walk us through a guided practice that is actually you doing a reflection um, around belonging, because we're talking about belonging in our bodies, but I think Reverend Zena said this, belonging is not just about our personal bodies, it's about our collective bodies. So we want to start with thinking a little bit about individually, what does belonging look like to us? And then collectively, what does belonging look like? So on a sheet of paper, if you're at home or virtual, please get out a sheet of paper, something to write with. And I'm going to ask us some questions, ask you to ponder these, and if we have time, we'll share at our tables. So as you're writing this, you can, of course, if we get to share, you can share what you want. You don't have to share everything. But the first question is this. Identify a time, a place, a space, a group of people, whatever, some time when you felt like you belonged. So first, identify a time a group of people, a place, a space where you felt like you belong, in your body. Not just because someone said, come in, you're welcome, but where you had this felt sense in your body that you belong. So first, just write a brief note to yourself. You don't have to write the whole thing. A time when you really sensed that you belonged. And then call to mind what it felt like in your body. Maybe you can even sense that now. Well, how did you know in your body that you belonged? So I'm not asking what your thoughts were yet. How did you know in your body that you belonged? That may take a little you know, revisiting. And if you're still a part of that place or space, what is it in your body that let you know that you belong? And what were you thinking? <laughs> what thoughts came up for you in this thing that you're, this place or space or this group that you're recalling in relation to belonging? 
what thoughts were you having or what thoughts do you have now about that belonging? And then when you finish that, let's flip it and do the opposite. I want you to identify a time when you felt like you didn't belong. Even if someone said, you're welcome here, when you in your body did not feel like you belonged. So first, name that time or that place or those people. <clears throat> time when you did not feel like you belonged. And then how did your body feel? What did you notice in your body that let you know that you did not belong? What was happening in your body? And then were there any thoughts attached to that, then or now? Any thoughts related to that time when you didn't belong? There may have been more than one, but this specific time. And then there's one more piece to this. <clears throat> what do you want to belong to? Don't stress out if you don't have all these answers. It's a reflection. But what do you want to belong to? And I will put these in the PowerPoint for later, so you'll have them. What do you want to belong to? And you can define that or describe that any way that you want. So what do you want to belong to? How are you that already? How are you already living into that? So this thing that you want to belong to, what you're describing, how are you already a part of that, if you are? How are you already living into this, what you, what you want to belong to? And if not, you can say that you're not. You can talk about that. So what do you want to belong to? How are you already belonging or a part of that, if you are? And there's just one more question. What gets in the way of this thing you want to belong to, or this place, or this group? What gets in the way of this belonging that you want to be a part of? What gets in the way? Or how do you get in the way? <laughs> right? how, what gets in the way, or how do you get in the way of belonging, or being a part of this culture of belonging that you're seeking? I'll say the questions one more time in case people are still catching up. What do you belong, what do you want to belong to? How are you already a part of that? And what gets in the way? Or how do you get in the way? I'm going to ask you to look at your reflection and decide what, if any of it, you're willing to share with someone else. It could be a portion of it. And since we've been sitting for a little bit, I'm going to ask us to get up and find someone else to talk to, someone who's not at your table. So just stand up, find someone quickly to talk to, 
and you just have about three minutes to share. Each of you get a ch chance to share something, whatever is comfortable for you to share or uncomfortable. So find someone quickly. I really love the energy of the conversation. I don't even know what you're saying, but I just, I love it. <laughs> I don't care, you're talking. <laughs> Great. So there are a couple of things that my partner was sharing with me, um, and I think she saw the notes, but she already knows these things. But a couple of things I want to say about belonging, and one of them is I've been thinking a lot about this. I don't think that we have to create belonging. I think we just need to remember and honor belonging. We already belong. We're already humans sharing a space, a time, energy. We're already humans sharing an experience on this earth at this time. We're already interconnected, and we were talking about that. And so I don't think it's a matter of creating so much as starting with where we are, starting with what's already. And then we have to create some things from there. But where are we already? Where are we already connected? And what does that matter? Like every single thing that we do impacts people across the world, right? And that, in that way, we're already interconnected. So we have this birthright to belonging. But again, the question is, what do we belong to? And who do we exclude in our belonging? Who makes the rules? And if humans made the rules, can't humans make new rules? Right? If these are the rules for belonging, who gets to make those? And who's included? What do we give up? What do we gain? So there are a few things that I'll share. I'm going to condense this in the interest of time, because with my partner, we also started talking about um, how we're connected energetically. And I've been reading a lot more in the last few years about the heart. And this is why I'm talking so much about the heart today and how much energetically we share with our hearts, how important the heart is. So when I heard this elder say, I'm placing my most important organ next to yours, my heart, I want to read you a couple of things that you may already know. But the heart sends more signals to the brain. This is from heartmath.org. The heart sends more signals to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. So when we talk about embodied knowing and the, the belonging beginning in the body, we can't intellectualize ourselves out of everything. I mean, intellect matters. It's important to know, right? Science really matters. All those things are important. But the heart has a lot of energy, a lot of electromagnetic energy that it's emitting that we need to pay attention to. So our bodies are constantly telling us things, and we might ignore them because we say, ah, no, nah, that's not true or we get that feeling that something's not right, or we should say something or wait to say something, and we don't pay attention to it. So our heart is constantly sending messages to our brain much more than the other way. It doesn't mean the brain doesn't matter. It just means the heart's very smart. It means we're meant to be connected as humans and that the connection already exists, and humans have broken it. Humans have broken those connections in a lot of ways. So um, a couple of other things. When our heart is experiencing things like fear, anger, frustration, sadness, disconnection, it creates incoherent heart rhythm patterns, like literally. If you look at someone's, um, is it the EKG? If you look at that, you can see scientists have tracked these rhythms, and they can track when you're experiencing joy and belonging and, and um, happiness, and the difference in the patterns. So there's a harmony that happens within the heart when we're experiencing things that are joyful and include belonging. Not only that, the heart, of course, sends signals to other parts of the body. So the vagus nerve sends a signal, right, if, if it thinks we're in danger. The heart gets those messages. And all of, in all of these ways, the heart is giving us instructions. So this is also interesting, I think. Um, when our hearts and bodies and our body systems, Dr. Zena, are operating harmoniously, we send out electromagnetic signals to others. And these signals, scientists and physicians are, are noticing, can be felt up to five feet away. So when we're in a room with other people, the signals our heart are sending out can be felt up to five feet away. So it's why when we walk into a room, we might sense, OK, this feels real off. Like, <laughs> there's something going on here, right? And it's also why we can walk into a room 
and go, wow, there's something here I can't put my finger on, but there's something happening in the way we welcome people in and create belonging that our hearts can signal to us and to our brains that might not happen if we only rely on our brains to tell us. So um, the last part, the electromagnetic field generated by the heart is the most powerful rhythmic energy field produced by the body. I just realized I forgot in the last activity to have people virtually. I'm sure you figured it out, Claire. My apologies to people who are virtual. The electromagnetic field, I'll say it one more time, generated by the heart is the most powerful rhythmic energy field produced by the body. So when we think about this elder's wisdom in saying, I place my most valuable organ, my heart, next to yours, you don't have to be that close, right? You can be five feet away. But the fact that we would do that, that level of vulnerability is where the power and belonging lies. So I want to ask us to do something in the time we have left, which is not much. I want to walk us through, it's kind of like power mapping if you've ever done that, and I'll explain it to you. But I really would love for us to think about three wishes or three hopes that we have for belonging. So as we're leaving tonight, I'll reiterate some of the essential questions or questions I think are essential. I'll name for you some anchors or principles that might be helpful for you. But in the meantime, if you have more paper, go ahead and get a clean side if you can. If not, I can see if we can get more. And I want to ask us to do this. So just listen for a moment. Where do you have a deep desire to cultivate or expand or connect cultures of belonging? So I'll say it again. Where do you have, thank you, a deep desire, if anyone, does anyone need more paper? Thank you so much. Where do you have a deep desire to cultivate, expand, or connect cultures of belonging? We'll just think about that for a minute. Where do you have a deep desire to connect with cultures of belonging or to expand, to honor, to cultivate any of that? And so the other part of the question is, or the, the ask is to name three wishes or three hopes you have for belonging. So on your paper, three hopes, or you can call them wishes that you have for belonging. That includes yourself, the personal, and includes the collective belonging. So what are three wishes or three hopes that you have right now for individual and collective belonging? So we talked a little bit about a time that you felt like you belonged or didn't, and now what are three wishes that you have related to cultures of belonging? And these can be big, they can be huge, they can involve people immediately close to you, doesn't matter. three wishes or three hopes you have for cultures of belonging. They may include you individually, they may be collective. And the next part is think about who is at the core of these wishes or hopes. So this is about thinking about where you have influence or agency or power. So who's at the core? And before you start writing, let me kind of break it down. So John Powell from the Othering and Belonging Institute talks about people who are on our short bridges, our medium bridges, and our long bridges, right? And short would be immediate people we have immediate agency connection with. 
So when you think about your wishes, you can write short, medium, and long under those wishes. So go ahead and write short, medium, and long under your wishes or your hopes that you just listed. Short, medium, and long. And again, long would be people we have the least in common with, we think, or the least physical or energetic connection to. Doesn't have to mean we're diametrically opposed, but they may be somewhere else. A long bridge example would be the man I mentioned who chased my daughter. That feels like a really long bridge for me. But someone else might be on the medium or short bridge for him. And then go ahead and think about who fits into those wishes you have and where they are, which bridges they are on. So for example, um, one, of the, one of the hopes I had that I didn't name for you, where is it? Uh, it's here somewhere. Oh, one of the wishes I had is that no one would feel isolated. That's one of my personal wishes. And so when I think about people on the short bridge of that for me, it's some of my family members who, for whatever reason, aren't immediately connected to the rest of the family because of their behavior, their choices, our choices. So I put family on the fringes on my short bridge. I have a connection to them, even though I'm not always connected to them. Okay, so that's an example. So just try to see who, uh, is within your wishes, where they are in proximity to you. In other words, your agency, influence. Are they on a short, a medium, or a long bridge? And you don't have to feel like it's a definitive answer. That can change over time. You might name people specifically. It might be groups of people. It doesn't have to be super specific. Who's on the short? Who's on the medium? Who's on the long bridge for you? And if you're ready for the last question, it is, what is standing in the way of the culture of belonging that you want? And how do we move forward anyway? What's standing in the way of the hopes or wishes that you have? And how do we move forward anyway? And that might be a general statement. It might be a commitment you have or have made. What's standing in the way of this culture of belonging you're wishing or hoping for? The answer might be, I don't know, in terms of how do we move forward anyway. Take another minute or two. You can take this with you, of course, into your communities that you are working with if you don't finish. So I'm going to quickly review where we were and then wrap up with a couple of things I want to leave you with. Um, we started with me asking you, what does the world need now? And what is your stake or your role in creating that, allowing that, reviving that? What does the world need now? And what does belonging have to do with it? We did the evening pages. We played the game, How's Yours? Then we started with just brainstorming what we think about when we consider belonging, and we pass those around. And then we t I talked to you a little bit about this idea of the heart as an invaluable part of understanding and knowledge when we think about belonging in terms of putting our most valuable, one of our most valuable organs next to other people's. And the idea of not throwing anyone away. 
and sitting with and working through how challenging that can be to not throw anyone away. And then we did a centering practice to ground us and connect us. And we talked about, or we wrote about at least, and then talked to each other about belonging personally, how we've personally experienced belonging or being othered and not belonging. And then right now, we did a bit of power mapping, if you will, around what we hope to see and what might get in the way. And so here are some essential questions I want to leave you with, and then three or four um, principles that might help as you go forward and, and just let this marinate more. But the first question I already read, what does the world need now, and what is your role in creating that? What does belonging have to do with it? Again, I'll send these out. What does it mean to not throw anyone away? <laughs> and what challenges does that bring? How do you want to belong, I'm sorry, what do you want to belong to? How are you living that already, and what gets in the way? And here's a question we didn't really talk about, but how can we say yes to belonging that honors our inherent interconnectedness, our uniqueness, and that also liberates us individually and collectively? How do we make space for who we are, where we have been, and how we want to be? So again, that imaginal, right? And, and leaning hope forward. The beautiful women I have done much of my racial equity work with over the years are part of an organization that does not exist anymore, but they created this, um, they created 10 principles for just about anything you do, but especially for working for racial equity. And some of them are so appropriate. I want to share these with you quickly. Knowing ourselves. So important. If we talk about belonging, we have to start with what do we belong to and how does that sit with us? What do our bodies know about that? So knowing ourselves is critical to knowing what we know, what we don't know, where we've been, experiences we haven't had, the traumas we've encountered that inform whether or not we can think about belonging. Organizing mind is a bit of what we did when we said what matters to us and what do we want to do with that. And so if we know ourselves and we use organizing mind to say what matters and where is our influence, then we also ought to think and act collectively. So working with other people is certainly much more impactful than working alone, and it also helps us navigate whatever it is we're dealing with. So knowing ourselves, organizing mind, thinking and acting collectively, and there's two more, taking risks and learning from mistakes. And I don't just mean just wantonly choosing something like, oh, that sounds good. Let's just try that, see how it lands. <laughs> I mean thinking and acting collectively with people to say, given what we say we mean about belonging, given what we know in our bodies and our minds about belonging, what is it possible to do? And how can we come back together when we make a mistake? Because it will happen at some point. I used to shy away from that, by the way. I was like, I don't want to make a mistake. I'm not going to try anything. <laughs> And then the last one is seeking connection and choosing love over fear. Because again, fear can disrupt a whole bunch of things. And fear can be useful, I mean, can, can be helpful in certain situations. But seeking connection, getting out of our comfort zone and choosing love over fear. And again, none, I'm not saying any of this is easy. So I will place all of these things in a PowerPoint for you in case that's helpful and you'll have them. The last thing I'd like for us to do, well, there's one more thing actually I want to say, which is thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here and meandering through this because there's so many different threads we could pick up and just go on and on with. I'm so grateful for your just willingness to be here. And the last thing I'd like to ask you to do is we'll end with the activity we started with of sorts. I'm going to ask you to take a post-it note and just do a one-word mood check. In other words, write down your mood right now. And there is no set answer. If your mood is, I'm t is tired, is annoyed, pensive, hopeful, whatever. One word, when you check in with your body, that best identifies your mood right now. Whatever that is.
one word mood check. And this is more just for you to understand where you are right now, if you don't already. But we are going to pass these around like we did at the beginning. So we'll just pass them to our right. <laughs> Read them. I should have said that to start. <laughs> and just pass them till you get yours back again. Without judging somebody else's mood, of course. When you have your own post-it back, make sure you collect all of your writing in case that's helpful. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful night. May we all be well. I'm going to welcome Reverend Zena back. <laughs> oh, thank, you. thank you. So I made up a word. My word was curiouser, curious ear. I'm more curious. I'm going to go with that. I'll, I'll work with that. Um, I feel so full. I spent most of the day at DCA at, at Reagan Airport because that little FAA thing this morning, I didn't know if I was going to get here. Um, and that's exhausting. And I, it's like that has all disappeared. Um, let me ask you a question. Not to share. Where do you feel most like you belong? I won't say what you said, Pam, when we were talking, but you talked about a place that when you're there, it's just right. And there is, um, it's, it's, it can be chaotic. I've been in that place with you. But it, but it is still filling and um, satisfying. Where do you belong? Because you don't belong everywhere. And we each have to have that place where we belong, where we go, where we can be filled and be restored and be readied to go out and try and share some of that, which will deplete you. You go right back to where you get filled up. Everybody needs that. You have to eat every day. And, and you, we have to eat of belonging on a regular basis as well. So I want, I want us to know where we can be recharged so that we're willing to take the risk to go out and spend it. If I know I can go get more money, I'm likely to spend what I have. If I know I can get more belonging, I'll share. And that belonging that begins in your body then get shared in the world. Where do you belong? Where do you get filled up? And then will you be generous enough to share it? Because you know you can go back and get more. The other thing that struck me tonight, every time you said belonging, Dr. Krista, you, you used all of the syllables. And I heard be long ing. Might it be that one way of understanding belonging is a, a state of existence where you desire and it's ongoing? Because the ING is a gerund, my favorite part of speech. Because it doesn't end. A state of existence, you are alive right now, you exist. A state of existence where there is desire. And I know long could mean why too, but I chose the desire. A state of existence where there is desire that is ongoing. And it doesn't exhaust and it doesn't deplete because we know where to go get it in order to go out again. Something happened in you tonight, happened in me, I don't know that we yet can name it, but if we will practice in the way we were invited, you will be a source of belonging. You'll be an example, a model, 
and your life will speak what your words may never articulate. Go and be simply as you choose to belong. Thanks for being here. See you next month.